Hi all, welcome to microbiology lecture. Um, we're going to start off very kind of broad, just defining what microbiology is. Uh, you know, most bio classes we start off very broad and, and just kind of give an overview of what we might be talking about or the subject material we're talking about in um, that course. And that's what I'm going to do t t in this lecture series. Okay, so first off, I want to talk about the diversity of life. And we know because we're alive, biology is the study of living things, but we know that these living things are diverse. Okay? So we've described and named um, a couple million species on the planet, and with most estimates out there, that we, we maybe have got 10%. Okay, and then if you um, take the most extreme estimates of how many species on the planet, we're more like 0.1%. I mean, there, there are estimates that there might be 3, 2 um, billion, potentially, different types of bacteria out there. Um, and if these estimates are right, then, yeah, we're a drop in the bucket so far on naming species, which it, it's probably true. We haven't named that many species. But things are diverse. We know that from our surroundings and from the naming process and the studies that we've done thus far. The cool thing about that diversity is that um, we have devised a naming structure, or at least a categorizing structure, in which we can categorize different things based on different traits, okay? And so, for example, um, things that might have the same cell type would fall in the same kingdom, or things that have certain structures inside their cell would fall in the same kingdom. Um, and, you know, even higher up than kingdom is domains, and domains gives us kind of two separate types of cells, um, and then within one of those cell types, uh, how their ribosomes might be structured or um, how their out, outer cell wall is structured kind of divvies up those kind of domains. But we know that things are diverse, and the cool thing about it is most of the time, members of those different kingdoms are different enough that we have pretty distinct categories. Okay? That being said, I, in this class, typically teach to the six kingdoms of life kind of ideology. I realize that not everyone believes there's six kingdoms of life. Some believe that it's more likely that there's seven or eight kingdoms of life because protista needs to be broken up. Others believe um, that potentially protista shouldn't be its own kingdom and they should be stuck within animalia and plant. Um, there's lots of different ways at which individuals like to divvy up the life that's on this planet. Um, for the purpose of this course, we're really going to just talk about the kingdom Archae, Bacteria, Protista, and then a few types of animalia and fungi. Okay? Um, so whether or not we split these more um, or you know, combine them is really not that important um, for the process of, of this class. We're not going to get into that those kind of details of classification. Within the kingdom, however, you know, looking at phylums and, and other uh, ways at which we divide up the organisms within the kingdom, um, those are even more contentious, more um, people disagree with the naming of certain species and even genera and family um, and whatnot. And we'll get into some of those issues and the renaming of certain organisms as we go throughout the class, okay? Um, we'll come back and we'll talk about what it means to be archae, what's the characteristics what it means to be bacteria and protista and fungi and animalia and even plantae, even though we 
probably won't talk too much about uh, the Kingdom Plantae in the micro class um, unless when you're taking soil samples you're remo removing plants then um, you should probably know the plants that you're removing. We'll come back to that. Okay. So before we dive into microbiology, if we look at the term microbiology and we say, all right, well, biology is the study of life, then maybe we need to define what it means to be alive or not alive. So living versus non-living. And a lot of just general public might consider many different points. Even students often consider different points. They might say, well, life is complex. Okay. Complexity, though, is not um, determining whether something is alive or not alive. Um, okay, But increases in complexity might give us an idea of um, when things may have evolved with things more recently evolved potentially being more complex or at least they've lost a lot of traits along the way and, and we can talk about that complexity from that point. Movement often is said like living things move, non-living things don't and, and really there's a lot of living things that don't move at all though they live in the same spot um, there that they reproduced in, were reproduced in, and they die in the exact same spot, um, and there's no, really no movement from that perspective. There might be internal movement of fluids and things like that, um, but movement that you could visualize is probably not um, happening for many of the organisms. Response to stimuli, um, sometimes I'll get this, and, and this is a good trait. It doesn't necessarily mean that something is alive or not living but it is getting to a point where it's testable okay and so I want to kind of caveat this um, before I go into the properties of life um, because there are biologists that do not believe in five properties of life they might believe in three of them or two of them they might classify things that don't fit all five still is living Okay? But in general, I would say most biologists would consider these five properties needed for things to be considered alive. Okay? And when we look at the five properties, normally, and what we've done in the past as scientists, is we've kind of agreed in order for something to be considered alive, it must fit exclusively in in one of these five or all these five things like it can't be missing one thing or two things um, because then we don't really have a definition of life or we need to change our definition of life which maybe we do and we can talk about that later okay? cellular organization is the first one so all living things are comprised of at least one cell okay? and this was generated and this is part of what we call the cell theory um, that was, you know, partly uh, done by um, Pasteur, and you know, had a piece of the cell theory. Um, Schleiden and Schwann had a piece of the cell theory. Robert Hooke, um, um, Van Leeuwenhoek, all these individuals, all these uh, scientists in, you know, the really the 1600s, 1700s, 1800s kind of devised a way at which we could start looking at cells and talking about organisms being compi comprised of at least one cell. Okay. Metabolism, so all organisms must be able to produce energy and, or should say produce but process energy. Some can produce it, okay, the autotrophs, so they have the capability of either you know, capturing sunlight or chemicals and producing their own energy for, for their cell, um, or heterotrophs, which would consume an organism and get the energy from, from that organism. And there's some organisms that are both autotroph and heterotrophic, um, and we'll come back and we'll look at those, especially in, in the grouping of bacteria. Okay. Homeostasis. Homeostasis is you know maintaining a stable internal environment um, often at being human we think of this well okay 
like stable meaning like one thing like your temperature is 98.6 and it stays basically 98.6 um, yes that's homeostasis but that doesn't mean if I had a petri dish of bacteria E. coli here and my office is 70 degrees that if I take those bacteria out in outside and it's 50 degrees and the bacteria are now 50 degrees it doesn't mean that they are not uh, not maintaining a stable environment or not showing homeostasis. It just means that they have a different optim optimization or a different uh, temperature tolerance than humans. Okay? So we need to think of homeostasis as just maintaining some range of values um, and, uh, and the ability for organisms to do that. Growth and reproduction, okay, um, all organisms have the capacity to grow and reproduce, pass their genes on to the next generation, which really gets at heredity, and these two together really kind of give you the term of evolution. All organisms have to be able to pass genetic information from one generation to the next, okay, um, that can be through asexual reproduction, sexual reproduction, it could be basically cloning of and passing your genes unchanged to the next generation or recombination of your genes to the next generation. But these two often um, are linked together in, in the form of really evolution and how things might change over time. Okay? And that kind of gets us to this sticky kind of um, are they alive, are they not alive uh, conversation that many biologists will have and that is viruses. Okay? So viruses technically have the ability to reproduce, they do carry um, genetic information but they're kind of missing the other three components or properties of life and therefore we normally consider them non-living although there are biologists that do consider them alive because one of the key components of, uh, of a virus is that they can evolve and they do evolve and life evolves and so um, that's debatable and we can talk about it until we're blue in the face but um, we're right now going to consider viruses in this course non-living, um, but that doesn't change uh, the importance of them to microbiology. Okay, so let's talk about microbiology a little bit. Again, we talked about this at the very beginning. Study of microorganisms or, or microbes. Often it's better to kind of use the term microbes because microorganisms suggest, organisms suggest that they're alive. Microbes kind of is a little more broad, so it might include things like viruses and pyrons and, and different things that we normally would consider non-living. Okay? Um, what does it mean to be a microorganism or a microbe? It means that entity is really visible under a microscope. It's not visible um, by the naked eye. Okay? So unaided human eye can't really see microorganisms. That being said, there will be some microorganisms that we talk about in this class like roundworms and other parasitic um, protozoans and, and even parasitic animals that play an important role in microbiology especially with this piece here, the disease piece of microbiology. Um, so that being said, sometimes the unaided human eye can see the organism that we're after, um, but most of the time uh, microscopes are used and that's where the micro part of microbiology comes in. So again, why should we care about microbiology? Well, diseases, a lot of human diseases are related directly to microbiology, whether that be viruses or bacteria or protozoans or some animal some, uh, or fungus, um, a lot of our human diseases are related to 
um, microscopic organisms um, or microbes in, in, if we're talking about viruses and pyrons. Food alteration, whether it be spoilage or some kind of new product through fermentation, alcohol or things like that, um, it can be very important microbiology to that. Digestion when it comes to our ability to digest food and other organisms' ability to digest different food products, especially when we're talking about heterotrophs. Um, the microbes in the digestive tract of heterotrophs trophs are extremely important for those organisms, and without them, um, a lot of the or a lot of the heterotrophs cannot uh, persist. They would be they'd be dead. And reproduction, whether that be reproduction and the role that microbes might play in enticing reproduction, uh, the role that microbes might play in determining an organism's immune system during reproduction or during the process of um, reproduction, like while the organism is in the womb or the egg or, or whatnot. Um, so microbiology can be very important for all these factors, and we'll talk more about it. All of them. Okay, so with that, we're going to next kind of jump topics a little bit and we'll talk about the early microbiologists and what they've done for the field or how they kind of um, made the field of microbiology.